Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to Creative Assembly Live Q&A. Uh, I'm Luke Johnson, Lead Recruitment Resource at Creative Assembly, and I've been there for just over four years now. Uh, and with me is Kevin McDowell. Hello, Hello. Kevin. Hi, uh, I'm Art Director for Total War. I've been at Creative Assembly for slightly over 20 years now, and I've been working in games for uh, almost 25 years. Cool. Yeah. So, um, Today we're here to talk about um, uh, our trainee roles. So um, we'll go through the roles that we have open. Um, so we've uh, each year we open our trainee positions. Um, uh, they're based in our studio in Horsham in West Sussex. Um, and uh, they're all full-time paid positions within the studio and uh, for 12 months initially, but uh, we have a very good record of turning those trainees into permanent studio positions. Um, We'll go through sort of each of them, but to let you know, in terms of what we have open now, we have a trainee animator position, a trainee cinematic artist, a trainee concept artist, a trainee technical animator, trainee UI artist, and a number of trainee programming vacancies currently live. Um, so yeah, we'll just go into a little bit about um, each of those roles uh, and what they're a little bit about. So um, Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about trainee uh, animator? Sure thing. Um, so I'm gonna give you a general overview First of all, I guess about the the um, trainees. Uh, trainees are uh, typically graduates, uh, um, although that's not exclusively true. Uh, some in some places we have people who have just been working, you know, on their own to figure stuff out. But um, if we look specifically at a trainee animator, usually what we'd expect is somebody who has studied animation and they've got an uh, an animation reel that is designed more for games than for film um, and what that means is that there's kind of more looping cycles and more action on it versus uh, storytelling um, we do also hire uh, and occasionally we have trainee um, cinematic animators uh, cinematic animators focus more on the storytelling side of things game plan Training, training gameplay animators will fo focus more on game animations. Um, and what we usually expect on your reel is for a graduate it will be something like between 30 seconds and a, and a minute of your best animation work, which should include some um, locomotion cycles. That means like walks, runs, um, and uh, some action. So some, some combat, some fighting, um, it, you know, jumping, acrobatics, things like that. So uh, we, we do actually get um, trainee animators in s two different kinds of flavors as well. Some some prefer to, to do humans and some prefer to, to do creatures and some prefer to have a go at both. And, and anything in that spectrum is fine. So that's, that's what we're looking for for trainee animators. Cool. Um, I will quickly say as well, um, uh, we have uh, it's a Q&A, so um, we are happy for you to start firing questions in as soon as you want to. And we'll get around to try and answer as many of those as possible. But we'll start off with some sort of general questions as well as we go through, just so you can all uh, you can all um, you know get get a chance to sort of learn a little bit more about that. Um, so we have a process as well, which we'll go through in a bit. But we'll just give you a, continue giving you a brief overview. So. Um, Kevin, trainee cinematic artists. Not many people might know what a what a cinematic yep. artist is and what they do. Um, so, can you give us a little bit about that and also sort of what you think are the key skills you yep. need to bring to that? So, this this will be one of the roles that I would expect that we would have the fewest applicants for, um, just because a lot of people going into games don't even think of this, and they don't even think it's the, they don't even think it's a thing. Um, so, we have teams internally that that create trailers um, and also in in game movies using using the game engine. So if you if, you know after the Q and A, if you go to totalwar.com and you see all of the in game trailers, those have been cr created by our internal cinematic team. Um, and what we're looking for uh, in in for that for that kind of candidate um, is somebody who is. It has got a great eye for composition, knows about storytelling, um, uh, has uh, got some skills in things like Premiere or After Effects. Basically, move, like you're you're kind of a a movie maker, um, and that's 
that, you know, that's the path that you want to go down is, is you want to make movies. Um, and again, it's, it's, I expect a lot fewer applicants for that sort of role than for, for most roles. Cool. Um, the next uh, role we have, which we'll go through, is um, probably the role we'll get the most applicants for in our current list of openings, which is yes. trainee concept artist, That's um, right, yeah. the most competitive of any of our roles that we tend to advertise. Um, so, yeah, yeah a, a concept artist, Kevin. And a lot of people, I think, from my side as well, when we receive applicants, the thing that stands out to me is that we get a lot of people that are storyboard artists or illustrators yeah. that mm -hmm. will apply. And although those are some of the skills that could be useful to us, can you explain yeah. a little bit more about a concept artist for people? Uh, so if you've got storyboarding skills, um, you're, I mean, for us, you're, you, you might even consider applying for the, uh, the cinematic role. Yeah. Um, so a lot of, a, a lot of students are a little bit confused about, the exact role of a concept artist. So we see um, uh, we see a lot of illustrate illustrators applying to the role, and we do we do a lot of illustration work within our games. But uh, we most you know that's mostly things that we contract out, and we usually get very experienced artists to do it. Um, on the other hand, all of the concept art that we do, uh, barring one or two contract contractors, is in house. Uh, and it's it's kind of you know, here's here's an odd fact, which is half of the people that are doing concepts um, at Creative Assembly s studied architecture, and the re the reason is that concept art, yes yes you do have to have great drawing drawing and painting skills, but fundamentally concept art is about designing, and you have to understand about design methodology above everything else. So if we're if we are going to hire a trainee concept artist we're going to look for we're absolutely going to make sure that there's great ideas in the portfolio that they have got new ideas fresh ideas um, they're exploring their references deeply and and they're, they're you know they're just not doing something that you know they're not doing derivative work uh, based on what they discovered last week because um, the reasoning behind what they do is as important as what they're producing as well for you guys that's right yeah yeah the, in fact more important um because concept work is also the one of the areas of work that that actually most of most concept art doesn't actually ship with the game so the the oddly enough the visual quality is not necessarily the highest priority on all concepts is the idea is the, is the first thing if there's if, there, if somebody's got great ideas and that's a place that we'd like to to build from um, cool um, yeah. oh, and, and and you say that we'll get lots of yes we will we this is a, the most competitive area yeah. <laughs> and um we will get the most number of applicants for yeah. concept art yeah cool um uh the next one then is obviously sort of training technical animator um so a little bit about that please um so Again, here's a role that is um, a little bit more ob obscure and people aren't necessarily aware that such a thing even exists. And I would expect to have much fewer applicants for... Yeah, uh, uh, there's, currently yeah. only, there's currently 30 compared to the yeah. concept art, which already has yeah. 241 applicants. That's right, yeah. So we're basically getting 10 times as many concept art applicants. Yeah. Um, a, what, a, a technical animator is... Um, it's we would consider that as a rigor plus some tech art skills, um, and what that is is your focused your focus is on the technical side of character art development. So you are creating the rigs for the animators to use, um, uh, including all like the bone setup and the uh, animation rig setup. You are um, helping the animators with any sort of optimization of animations or cutting and pasting animations across skeletons. Uh, and you may be helping the character artists with the skinning of all of the uh, character art that do as well. Uh, so that skinning is like, you know, binding the model to the bones so that the models move with the animated bones. Um, so that's the, the core of uh, a rigger's role. A rigger's it's it is it is a technical role, yeah. um, but you still need you, you need to have artistic sensibilities as well, uh, and they often come together. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> it is yeah. a rarity. Um, yeah. The next one, obviously, is the trainer UI uh, artist position. Um, and you've previously done talks on why people should be a UI artist yep. uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, a little bit about UI art. So, um, uh, UI art is a, another kind of uh, underserved area. Uh, I've, I've actually yet to discover a uh, a course in the UK that focuses on UI art. Um, and again, if we look at the number of applicants that we've got. Uh, 61 for that. 61. So, you know, that sounds like a lot to anybody that's applied. But <laughs> but for us, it's it's kind of yes. mid, like low-ish, mid, mid to low. Um, and the, um, uh, the, the thing about UI art for us is it's it's kind of standing for us. It's kind of standing halfway between graphic design and illustration. So we have a very what's called skeuomorphic UIs, and that means we have a lot of vi the, the visual aspect of the of the UIs is r kind of representing real world materials and real world ideas. Now some th this is opposed to a flat UI, which everybody's familiar with, which is just kind of flat colors. Um, so we are looking specifically for somebody who have a great kind of eye as a graphic designer, but are also very good illustrators, um, which again, is kind of a, a, a it's more rare combination. Yeah. And what, what, what uh, these people will be responsible for is doing the, the layout of the, U, of the UI within the game, designing the UI, like it's graphic design, designing the UI, doing the, the layout and creating all of the individual um, 2D graphics that go everywhere in the UI. So it's a, it is a very interesting role from the point of view of it is really like 50% design and you're very working very closely with game designers and coders and then it's 50% um, art where you're making like beautiful, um, if small uh, pieces of artwork. I think as well, it's it's important to say as well, especially for for the Total War games. Um, uh, you know, UI is a very prominent feature um, yeah. in the games, um, mm -hmm. and for certain other games, that might not indeed be the case. Um, yeah. So I think you know, it's something that um, most of the players of our games probably will experience uh, every single time. Um, and yeah. so it's 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 a really important part for us uh, in terms of getting that right. The other role, trainee role, we currently have open at the moment is trainee programmers. Um, so uh, trainee programmers uh, are. C++ programmers within CA um, and we have numerous positions for those each year now we tend to just advertise for uh, training programmers and uh, we'll say that you need C++ they will um, split into areas of expertise based on sort of your skill base um, but also what we require um, within the teams and that sort of goes across for all of our roles really um, we write job descriptions to hopefully give you an indication of the type of thing you'd be working on um, we are a game studio, so unfortunately, we have lots of projects which we haven't announced. We have lots of things we're working on which we cannot announce for various different reasons, which means that our job descriptions might not necessarily give you exactly the project it's working on. So what we need to do uh, in that respect then is try and give you some information to help you with, what, you know, with us sort of telling you about what we're applying for. So um, when we put concepts up for example at the moment kevin we sort of have an idea within our studio of what they'll be working on and what project yeah. they'll be on and obviously that might mean we can or, or cannot say about that so we try and put in there what we're looking for from you so portfolios for us they will have more relevance based on what's what's in there um uh, and the same is if you're a pro you know if you're programmers and and you know um it's graphic you know, graphics is where your interest is, but that isn't what we rely on at the moment. That doesn't mean to say that your skill level, a rejection is based on your skill level. It's that we have people who are more suitable within that. And that's something I think across the industry people need to learn is that you may indeed be very skilled, um, but just not relevant for the role that we have. Um, and that's not a slight on you. And um, that's simply the position we have. So, um, you know, uh, the easiest examples are often the, the more extreme or silly examples. So if you are an artist who loves drawing cars and vehicles and things like that, um, there is definitely roles for you in the games industry, but it's unlikely to be at our studio. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's the... I would, I would never even get an interview as a, as a trainee um, technical artist, for example. Yeah, and I think just don't have those skills. <laughs> it's important as well if you are, if you, you know, for the artistic roles, for animators, for 
for, for, for people who are putting together portfolios, um, you know, and I'll go through, I know lots of you are asking as well online about other roles that we don't have advertised, and we'll go into some of those as well, and the processes and how we identify who's better and, and what we look for in each stage of an application. Um, but I think the main thing from us is, is that we like interesting things, we like seeing things that are, you know, that, that, that we don't often see, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the times, you know, if you're coming from university, you all have group projects, meaning that you all contribute towards something. And when we see the same thing in every portfolio, um, it, you know, it's um, the, the one that stands out is the one that does the additional work, that does the extra work, that puts the extra effort in. Um, it really does stand out uh, in that initial stage. But your, your portfolios uh, should be, you know, what you're skilled at doing, what you like doing, um, but also think about if you see if you're putting together work and if you took your work and said what game does that relate to that's the studios you should prioritize in applying to because that's where you're going to have the highest chance of being employed so the um the there's you know there's different triple a studios we all focus on different things the the strange thing is you know the people that are most likely to to get the the trainee roles are if you if you look at it from the art director's perspective um you know, we're looking for somebody who is the most suitable for a particular role that we have open and we're working in a particular style so if if a person puts is, has put all their eggs in this one basket you know if you love working in this one style and if you love making character art in this particular style as long as there are games companies out there making things in that style you're actually putting yourself for those companies on a higher um, echelon compared to other applicants because they like from my perspective if i see you're for example you're making uh fantasy characters in a style that is suitable to warhammer or you're making historical characters that are realistic and suitable to our games but i know that you're gonna you're going to ease right into what we're doing and you're, you're going to also love what you're doing here so um it's it's kind of an easy match uh, so i would suggest that as long as the kind of work that you're you're working on has got a commercial outlet to to really like push the stuff that you love and and, and focus on that cool um uh so yeah i can see lots of questions are flying in so we'll try and sort of uh, hopefully cover them off as we go through but um but um we'll go through a little bit about the the stages um sort of for an applicant so um the first thing everyone sees when you apply to us is uh, a cv um, but for most of the artistic roles, that's not the first thing anyone will look at. It, it's your portfolio. Um, and if you don't have a portfolio, um, there's a reason why you might suddenly get rejected. Um, we do occasionally try to ask, but um, as we say, because we have so many applicants, it's difficult for us to, sh you know, to manage that volume with asking every single applicant who forgets to put a portfolio link yeah. in there to send one thing. So put put your, por this is, this, you know, actually I can see, I've got a secret thing. I can see the list because <laughs> mistakes people make on their applications. Um, this is the number one thing, biggest mistake is people don't have a link to their portfolio and you would be surprised. I would say that 25% uh, of applicants don't actually have any portfolio link, even experienced artists. Um, and that is, pretty much grinding your application to a halt personally i will try to chase it down but i'm not the only hiring manager on the team and there will be loads that cannot be bothered to be honest um so i would say put you know put your put your link in your application put it on your cv put it on the images that you, you know, that you're yeah. submitting just overdo it make sure that we know <laughs> where your portfolio is um please let us find it yeah. easily. Put it on ArtStation too, don't put it on some strange site. Yeah, I would say as well, the main thing is that um, that when we look for concept artists, when we look for things, we have specific job titles because we're looking for a specific thing. So if you are um, someone who consider themselves to be skilled in multiple areas, um, so you do concept, but you also do character art and you do a bit of environment art and you do it in 2D and you do it in 3D and everything else, um, we want somebody who wants to be the thing we're employing. So we don't want somebody that isn't sure of what they want to be. So that, um, if you have a website and it has all of these things on, please direct us to the area we need to look at <laughs> so that our initial interaction with you isn't, oh, do they even want to be 
what we're hiring because you don't want to leave that ambiguity in there. We are looking for people to tell us, I want to be this, this is what I want to do, and this is how skillful I am at it. Um, I will say as well, we often say some of the roles are advertised and we'll say graduate and things like this because that tends to be most of where we get our applications. Um, I'll get this out of the way first of all because we often say it when we do talks. We do not employ qualifications, um, we employ skills. So just because you have uh, done a certain course, attended a certain thing, there is not an automatic assumption from us that that means you have the skills necessary. Um, for certain things like programming, you know, if your course is all in C++, it gives us an indication that you have some understanding. But guess what? The first thing we do is send you a multiple choice C++ test to see what level of understanding you have to see if we can move you through to the next stage. For um, a lot of our art roles, um, the fact that you did a course is fantastic and everyone learns differently and you know we'd never discourage anyone from doing that but doing a course alone and getting a grade from that doesn't mean your application it moves forward does it and and no uh, and also also you don't have to actually have graduated from anywhere you maybe you dropped out because you were not learning what you wanted to learn in your course and you spent the next last two years working on your portfolio it's fine just apply yeah, maybe you started as uh, an architect, uh, Kevin, and ended up as an art director in a game studio. Quite possibly. In fact, <laughs> maybe you even dropped out of architecture school. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's certainly. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of sort of the, the processes, so for, for most of our roles, what will happen is we will have the initial, obviously, opening application stage. We'll invite you to submit a CV, uh, send us a portfolio, and also, if you wish to, any accompanying attachments, any links you want to add, um, but also a cover letter. Um, the reason we say that is because we want to give you the best chance to demonstrate to us you have the skills that we look for. It is not a trick. Um, what I tend to always tell people is that um, we have a job description, we are trying to be helpful and we bullet point what skills we are looking for. So what we're asking for you to demonstrate. So uh, in a cover letter is another chance for you to evidence to us how you meet those requirements. Um, and so that can be, you know, um, from sort of lighthearted things to do with if you've worked in teams, if you've done these things, um, the, a sort of additional evidence of those. Um, but more importantly, it would be a chance for you to link directly to the bits and pieces of work in your portfolio, in your showreel, a game you've made, a game jam, mods, you've, whatever it is, we'd like to see it so that we can see, you know, what your skill is, what your passion is and what you enjoy doing. Um, and that's a big thing for us. Um, after you go through that, most of our roles then will move through to we will have a pre-screening call um, with someone in the recruitment team. That would be um, uh, Jody generally does them at the moment, but if she's obviously busy, some of the other recruitment team will take over that. Um, and in that, we just make sure you understand, first of all, um, what we're looking for, where we're based uh, and all those sorts of things. Um, I would add now, this is a very good point of if you if you're applying for lots and lots of roles, make sure you keep track of that because it's not the most impressive thing when we engage in a conversation with you and you cannot remember where you've applied, where we're based, who we are and what role it is that you've applied for. Um, we get that everyone needs a job, but we need you to be a little bit more organized and on the ball, hopefully, um, because that is a characteristic that we like in people, um, that, that they're able to do that. So you'll have a, a pre-screening call. Um, that is just to check everything aligns, make you understand a little bit more about us and what we do and everything else, um, and see if you've got any initial questions. Uh, from then, you will then have a, a, a normally a Skype or video call or Teams call with the hiring managers. Um, that will last between half an hour and an hour generally. Um, uh, and then after that, the following stage will be a in-house studio interview. Obviously not at the moment, we're doing a second Teams interview um, where we will go through again a little bit longer. Um, those will last and you'll you'll get to meet more of the team um, and we'll go through all the questioning and everything else. Um, and then generally from that, a decision. Some of them will have additional tests in there. So occasionally for animation to separate candidates because there's lots of them, we will send out a short animation test just for you to be able to, uh, us to have established the best 10 or so people because um, as much as we'd love to interview and give everybody a chance the man hours alone and um, because we are making games uh, means that we cannot do that um, so we need to interview we need to streamline we need to get in the best people we can so we may in there may be short tests within that to do that um, programmers will sit a test with us um, to establish their level of skill um, and where their where their knowledge base is and then obviously, yeah, again, a decision from there. So um, uh, a lot of the questions are coming in, Kevin. So um, yep. I'll start with some of the questions that people have asked. Um, 
for which uh, one of the interesting ones here is from Plath is, uh, do you have any advice for handling nerves during interviews? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, the first thing I do, if, if, if you get really nervous in an interview, tell the people that you're interviewing with that you get really nervous in an interview, and then they will expect that you're going to be really nervous, and then you will feel less nervous because they know that you're going to be nervous and that they're going to expect you to be nervous. Uh, so that's the first thing that I would do. Um, and secondly, um, like from my point of view, if I'm interviewing somebody who's very nervous, I don't usually see that as a negative. I see that as it, what, what's that, what that is an indication of to me is that this is somebody who, who cares about what they're doing and they're taking it seriously. And unfortunately, you know, the, maybe their nerves have overcome them a little bit, but I, I would rather, you know, somebody cares that they're coming to interview with uh, with us so i don't i don't hold it against somebody that they're nervous yeah certainly i, and think I just tell them you know they tell me oh, i'm so nervous i'm like oh i'm nervous and i tell them i'm, <laughs> I'm interviewing you i'm nervous too i hate doing interviews basically <laughs> so i think it's an important thing to realize as well that everyone is human and we all do realize that and, and everyone in our studio has been in your position where this is the first interview they've gone to the first job they've applied for the first triple h studio they've been to and we completely understand that and we try and relax you as well as much as possible um and nerves aren't something to be scared of i sort of um had a, a, a practical father who um would sit me down and do interview training with me uh, at, at a dinner table when I was a young lad um, to try and get me prepared for the sorts of questions you might be asked and how that might be. I would certainly say utilising and practising is something that can be beneficial. Um, you know, if you've got parents who, who are employed, who've had different jobs, they probably would have attended lots of different interviews and they can go through the generic types of questions you may be answered so that so that you know what sort of questions you should, you know, you should have anything the other thing as well is is that if you are if you're someone who is really nervous um there's nothing that says in an interview you can't take in notes you can't take in things with you so that you are prepared that could be you have particular examples of things you've done that you're really proud of uh, of, of of projects you've worked on that you want to talk about in more detail you can make notes about that so you remember to bring up the key things it's not an exam at university where you can't bring in any notes um we're more than happy for you to do that um that's a brilliant idea. I mean, in fact, even my art directors and art leads that um, on, on my team, if they have to have a difficult conversation with somebody and, you know, leads, it's not like there's some magic like manager gene and they all can stomp around doing stuff. They get very <laughs> nervous about this type of thing as well. And I say to them, if you're going to have a difficult conversation with somebody, what you need to do is, is make a list of all the things that you need to say. Uh, and bring that list in with you and then make sure that you get through that list. Yeah. And I think the um, the other thing as well is we, an indication of what to expect at the interview, again, is on the job description. So the, the main skills we're looking for, we will question you about in an interview. Um, you know, they're there to find out about you, but they're also there to help us knock off that, you know, and demonstrate that you have these skills. So I've done it myself where I've, I've been in an interview, I've got listed down what I need to demonstrate. And because conversations flowed or it's been a bit trickier or whatever it is it means that they haven't necessarily the interviewer hasn't asked all the questions they wanted to but time is running out so they'll say to you have you got any questions and I will look then at my list and think oh I do need to get these things across because this highlights why you'd want to employ me um, so I will I will bring these and when we say do you have any questions that's a fantastic chance for you to get across any additional skills you think you have um, that would be of interest you know to the people interviewing you. So you're your interviewer should always ask that question and you should always be prepared with your list of three or four things that you want to know uh, about the company and they, they can be hard questions too like what's your take on crunch you know don't shy away from it just <laughs> ask the question because you want to know you yeah. want to know before you start what's the company's take on crunch yeah i think as well the main thing as well is an interview is 50 percent us finding out whether you're someone who should work at our studio, but the other 50% is you working out whether we're a studio you'd like to work at. Um, so that means that the people you're interviewing with, if they're your hiring manager, is that someone you'd like to work for? Is that someone you see yourself fitting in with? Because um, as you certainly get older, one of the things that that, keep, that you know you become more, more conditioned to is 
you go into an interview and you speak to people and you quickly work out whether you'd enjoy working there or not. When you're when you're, you're young and it's your first ever interviews, you're so nervous about trying to impress them. You forget to work out whether you'd like to work there yourself. Um, but that is a really, a really good thing to sort of put into your own mind as well to relax you that actually these people need to also demonstrate why they should be someone that should employ me. Hopefully. Um, we've got another question, Kevin, which yeah. is probably related to you as well. Yeah. So it's, um, uh, uh, which is, I'm 32 year old architect yep. and I've always had a passion for video games. Okay, good. Um, so if you want to work in games, first of all, your portfolio has to be suitable. Um, Luke? Yeah. What do I think of ArchViz? <laughs> um, it's soulless. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, and it, it provides, and I, I even said to you, you, said, you know, I'm not a, an, an artist in any way, and I, I mm. wouldn't profess to having a particularly artistic eye. However, yeah. um, as polished as an image can look, if it is the same images with yeah. absolutely no interest, you know, yes, it looks, yeah. it looks what it, like it, what it looks like. But I've got, yeah. I, you know, once I've looked at one image, then the, the other fifty. I don't yep. care about. That's right. So the so the the key difference between your architecture portfolio and your games games environment art portfolio is you have to have storytelling and history in your games work. You, the place has to look lived in, and you have to look at the environment and be able to see what the history and story of each building, each place is. That's that's crucial for. Um, and then you have a mood with lighting and everything. So you have to make a, a place that feels authentic. Um, and usually that involves um, bashing it up a bit and pouring crap all over it. So and I would say that it's yeah. paraphrased. Um, so that's that's the difference. The, so there, so architecture is a great background skill, but but there is a different approach in games and that's what you've got to show us yeah and i would say that there's a there's a there's a there's a difficult way of doing that which is you try and create it from scratch without any instruction however um there are lots of ways to gather about what should be in a in a portfolio to interest us and i would say the most simplistic way to do that is if you have certain studios of interest you go on linkedin and you find out who the artists are that work within those studios. Then you go and literally type in their name and portfolio and probably their art station or various other things will pop up. And you click on those links and look at the work they have. The, the newest work generally is their professional output. But if they have their amateur, you know, or their pre-professional era work in there, um, which can even be a professional standard, as we often mm -hmm. find, Kevin, don't we? Yep. Um, you will look back and you will see their initial pieces and you will see this is the portfolio that got them a job, that got them a job at the studio you're interested in. So they're key because they will all have elements or components within them that you will see, oh, that translates. That's exactly, you know, if it's if it's character artists that work at our studio and they have lots of realistic human characters from the very beginning, guess what? That might be why we were interested in them. Um, if it is that it's concept artists and you know there's a certain there's a certain trend within those again i would certainly say that 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 looking at artists we've employed is the easiest way to work out what we like to see because they're employed here for that reason um, and that's a very easy way so the more the more portfolios you look at of professional artists the bigger indication that should be of the types of work you should be producing for your portfolio to get employed in our industry um, Another question here, Kevin, which yeah. I think um, is a good thing as well of uh, job titles and what those are within studios. So um, mm. uh, we've been asked, what kind of thing do you look for in a map designer, um, which isn't really a, a job you will see advertised, yeah. Um, yeah. but um, uh, I think I, I, I'm not sure Kevin knows oh, exactly the type of role yeah. you're looking for. So level, so level, level designer yes. would be the normal um, way it's called. Uh, so um level designers typically don't work for their department they typically work for the design department so what i would look for in a, in a level designer would be different than than what a um what the design team would look for uh so but there's crossover so i'll sort of ex explain both sides of that fence um so the um the design team is typically going to be looking for all of the ways that you've implemented the gameplay mechanics and and you know for you to understand the, like the heat maps of the levels what is intent what the intention of the design in each area of the level is making sure that there's like not dead areas of the level where nobody travels to 
etc. So from from the designer's point of view, it's all about how the gameplay functions. Um, from the art team's point of view, we you know we want to work with level designers who have an appreciation for the the aesthetic side of the level design, which means um, uh, an understanding of lighting, an understanding of proportion. It's just you know we find that some level designers don't necessarily get on with proportion in the same way that artists get on with proportion. So we'll get strangely shaped buildings and things like that, um, <clears throat> which we then, which we as the artists have to go and then discuss with them and fix it, you know, because it's a back and forth thing. Um, so we want the level designer to have a good idea of proportion, um, good idea of, of making areas of visual interest to do with maybe different materials, uh, you know, grass, rocks, sand, and different configura configurations. Um, and, and then an understanding of how lighting is going to work within the level. So that's true. Hopefully, should answer your question. <laughs> it is. I think the uh, then, I think the split up there as well as design in a lot of AAA studios involves no artwork at all, um, and um, and so uh, uh, there may and be indeed be courses that are called design courses at different education establishments, yeah. and part of that course is producing three D assets and artwork, mm. um, and that is not what a designer does in our studio yep. and if you have if you are if you are a an artist and you have a design documentation in there that won't particularly impress us um and if you're a uh, applying to be a designer and you have lots of 3d art assets that's not going to interest them either um for us and that is for a lot of triple a studios as well we tend oh, to yeah, there's, of, a, there's a hard fence between those two things yes there right. certainly is yeah. And we and we also we employ specialists to do the specialist thing. We don't want people to to we don't want to ask a designer who's not particularly good at art to produce art for our game because that would not work. The same as we don't ask a designer to program if they're not a programmer. Um, so, yeah, so there is a clear split within the studio of those. There is a lot of interaction between the departments, um, but, you know, you are not expected to contribute to those. Um, we have a, a, a question, Kim, which I think a lot of people will ask as well, um, which is, um, what is the expectation for a trainee in the company? Um, what level are you expecting? What kind of work uh, are they expecting to work? Yep. So, um, you, you know, we will get a lot of we will get a lot of applicants for our training roles, and this is going to be the same across all AAA studios. Um, so, we are looking for a high degree of uh, artistic accomplishment. Um, without necessarily all of the technical understanding of the ins and outs of the engine um, uh, un underneath it all. Um, so that's going to make your portfolio shine. It's all about the portfolio, really. I mean, we, when, we, when we look through all the, all of, Luke mentioned it earlier uh, in passing, but when we, when we look through all of the applications, we don't read the CVs, we don't look at your name, we don't look at where you're living, we don't look at any of that. We just go straight for the portfolio, and then the portfolio is the first gate. That's a yes or no, basically. And then if we think, oh, this is a good portfolio, then we start digging into the rest of it. Um, and if it's not, if, if the portfolio is not appropriate for us, then, you know, that becomes a, a, a no, and then we don't, we'll never have looked at your CV or cover letter or, or anything. So that's the first um, gate, really. Um, and so so we do expect a high degree of accomplishment and that usually requires that you focused on one one area only um so for example i can see in your question that you want to apply for vfx or environment art um so if you want to work at a triple a studio my advice would be to focus on on one of those two things uh, we tend to get a lot more environment art applicants but there also tends to be a lot more environment art roles so yeah yeah and i think that's the other thing as well is that there are certain departments within our studios where they are not large departments they don't have a hundred employees that do that mm. thing there might yeah. only be three or four meaning that those 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 roles are, are advertised far less um there is far less opportunities for you to join studios in that capacity but in terms of also thinking about what studios will have a number of those vacancies? Look at the games they make. Um, 
you know, if if you are if you are looking, um, you know, we have uh, a number of VFX artists because there is a lot of FX in our games, mm. um, uh, and and you will look at certain games and see that they that the set the same level of thing is not within their games. Um, so for environment art, for example, Total War has an uh, abundance of environment art that needs to be created on all yeah. of its projects. Um, yeah. But if you know, if you work on uh, uh, you know a two D platform game, guess what? There's going to be less of those sort of you know, and and I think that's where, in terms of looking at the types of jobs that are going to be available as well, um, if you're really good at FX and you also think you're really good at environment art, look at professional output, engage where you you are, and I think the ability to be honest with yourself and judge where you're at is a is a really good skill we have is um, that we look for because. People who think they're perfect at, all, at everything, um, uh, quite often uh, we we will, you know, in an inter interview establish that that might not be the case, that your level of your own, uh, uh, you know, valuing your own skills um, is off of what we'd look for. Uh, and certainly the other thing as well I'd mentioned within there is that we look for the highest level of skill. We can teach you processes. We can teach you um the practical aspects of of how things happen, why they happen, and the way they happen in our studio. We don't expect you to know how we make games, but we do. Is, is is we want the highest level of skill we can, and for you to be open to us to to doing it in the way that we like it to be done. Um, and again, that will change and develop as we develop as a studio as well. So, um, you know, certain processes will always change because there's ways of refining those and making those better. Um, Kevin, can you give some advice yeah. to UI artists? Uh, what, are, sure. what are you looking for? Which skills do you need to have yeah. and show in a portfolio um, as an, okay. artist, an artist at, uh, UI artist at CA? Um, uh, yeah, I think I kind of covered this a little bit already. Um, so you need kind of layout skills for you know doing panels. You need skills in doing icons. Um, uh, and what I would recommend is doing some mock-ups, like doing some mock-up game screens, uh, like panels, you know, do four or five panels, do, uh, you know, a few dozen icons, and that should kind of form the, the foundation of your portfolio. Lucy wants us to get moving on questions, so let's Okay. I'm rip okay. Cool. We'll go through. Now. So, uh, one yeah. of them that quickly says there as well is about um, is age important in becoming a trainee? And the answer simply there is no. Um, uh, well, you'll have to be a certain age, right? Yeah. You have to be like eighteen or whatever, I guess. But but I mean, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't be fourteen or fifteen, and yeah. unfortunately, employment law means you can't. But, 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 but otherwise, no you don't discriminate based on yes. age, right? If no, you're yeah. if you're sixty and you're thinking of becoming a trainee, that will treat you just the same as anybody else. Yes. Yeah, and what I would say is that that if you're moving from an outside industry, one of the things to be be to understand is if you are coming some into any industry from another industry as an entry level role, that comes with that entry level salary. So you may have a lot of experience you can bring into it, but it doesn't translate to what you're able to output, meaning you can't expect the same level of salary you were on. Um, that's right. And that's just being honest to so that you don't feel that that's misleading in any way. Um, next question from uh, Andy is, uh, do you have any graduate roles? What kind of things do you look for in graduates and perspective? Hopefully that, uh, and I'm looking for an environment artist role. Good news, we covered this hopefully a bit, uh, a bit earlier. The, we have certain roles uh, open at the moment. We do not have a trainee environment artist role at our studio, but other studios will have these. Um, we change which uh, our trainee roles are each year depending on what we require what we need and what we can help develop so um, again it does need it does mean that each year these do vary slightly in numbers and in variety um, so you just need to keep looking for that uh, and I'd also direct you to the U if you don't know what studios there are in the UK or near you the UK games map is a fantastic tool of looking at every studio that exists art house and everything else in the uk that helps with the games industry so you can look at everywhere that you could get employed so you can look directly at yep. those sites as well um uh, another question is uh of uh, other than technical skills what's the most important thing uh that recruitment's yep. looking for um, so let me answer this one this is a great one um so your, your portfolio is the first gate the second gate really is you know once you once you get an interview is your personality and we're looking for people who we are looking we are looking for a certain kind of personality you can be introverted you can be extroverted that's okay we are looking for people who are open minded uh, collaborative like to learn from others like to share with others uh, yeah. we want a, we want a team member we don't want an you know an auteur an artiste 
<laughs> I would say as well, the key thing there is um, if, you know, we, we um, hiring managers tend to ask questions in certain ways to try and elicit natural reactions from you. So if you are someone who is naturally quite argumentative and things like that, that's something to be wary of when you go into an interview, um, because we may challenge you and say, oh, that doesn't look very good or we don't like that, just to see what your natural reaction is. And if it's generally one which is, you know, a negative that's going to really stand out for us so yeah i want you to stand up for yourself and i want you to to give us your honest opinion about things but in there's a way of doing that in a collaborative way yeah so. Yep. Cool. Um, the next question uh, we have is, uh, 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 we're running there, 15 years old. They're really interested yep. in going to 3D uh, level yep. design. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you look for in a designer like that? Uh, so I think we kind of already covered level design, yeah. but you might mean environment design I, as I an environment mean, artist. Yes, um, that's what I think. So for an environment artist, um, and I again touched on this earlier, is you're going to build props, you're going to build environments, and they must be things that um, have got history and can tell a story. We don't want really like the land. I've made a, I've modeled a car, I've modeled a trash bin, I've modeled. <laughs> we need something that's a, that goes in a scene and goes in a set and helps tell the story, and that means it's got some kind of history to it. Um, cool. Let's see. Is Art Station needed, or for example, is it okay to link an in Instagram account? Um, uh, put your stuff on our station. Instagram is does not feel like permanent portfolio website. It's going to make you seem less professional. So just put it on our station. I would I would certainly say as well from um from looking from my perspective of looking at applications when I first came in, I can I can almost guarantee that um uh, if an Instagram account is linked, it tends to be not as the same standard as yep. the ones where they've created their own website or it's on ArtStation or Behance or, or Vimeo or any of the others. Um, yep. The other thing I quickly chuck in there is, is we have a lot of artists will put together video reels <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that might look snappy and good, but we need to look at each individual image and dissect them and look at yeah. what you've done. So perhaps that always isn't necessarily the best yeah. thing to do. And also, it's not always a matter of you finding us and you sending us your your portfolio. Quite often, it's the other way around, where I'm I have roles open and I'm looking to find you. And if you're on <laughs> ArtStation, then I can find you. If you're on yeah. Instagram, I'm probably not going to find you. <laughs> um, so uh, a question here, which is more about how to art direct um, rather yeah. than how to get in the position as art director. So how do you create a clear art direction? What tips do you have? And uh, are there great tools to know about um, that will help you guide towards art direction uh, for a project? Uh, so what I want to do with, it's, it's quite funny, but like the, the, the actual, what we might call the art direction for a project for, for me is, um, Okay, the first thing is you've got to be a great hiring manager and hire a great team. That's that's actually the number one thing about art direction is having great people. And then your life's easy. Um, but actually, if, if you're just looking about art direction, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly small task making the art direction for a project, and it has a but it has a huge impact on the on the project as a whole and the potential success of the of the project. So. Uh, when I'm looking, for example, at any Total War game, I'm, I'm looking at making the, discovering what the quintessential feeling of that period is, and also for any assets that we make for the game, whether they're buildings or helmets or terrain. Um, I also want to get the quintessential version of, um, uh, of those items as the thing that's built. So, for example, if we're if we're doing, you know, Rome Total War, we're making Spartans with these quintessential, I love that word, uh, Corinthian helmets, right? They didn't wear those helmets. Those are not the helmets that they wore. They wore these things that look like um, plant pots, like quite literally, they look like plant pots. And they're not cool. Um, so we need to find the stuff that is cool and is evocative of the period. Um, uh, and then we need to look at the overall uh, theme for the game. If you look at 3K, we have flowing ink. If you look at uh, Shogun 2, we have woodblock prints that have got kind of a um, pastel color theme and cherry blossom color theme to the whole thing. Uh, so just at the very making very high level choices that feed in through the whole game can have a huge impact. 
but those things are not that hard to come up with but you know if you're thinking about it that way <laughs> think about like what's the quintessential what's the perfect theme for this particular game and then work with that and push it through the whole project Cool. Um, we have uh, uh, an interesting question here, Kevin, which is someone would yeah. like to know a little bit about you and your background. So what yeah. positions have you held uh, on your yeah. path to becoming an art director? Um, uh, environment artist and then lead environment artist and then lead artist and then lead FMV artist and then lead artist and then art director. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, but I, I've done a lot of UI and character art along the way as well. But those yeah. are my things that I've, I've done. And I, and I would certainly as well, I, I know that um, it's very rare that it does happen, but occasionally we will get people that will apply that will put in there they want to be an art director straight away. That's the position that is of interest to them and they want to do that straight yeah, away. That's not, that's not possible. No. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something you work up to rather than you. you work up to, yeah. Yeah, and it's a career development. And at CA, we you know we have a learning and development team, and we take you know the development of staff something that is taken very seriously, and we we certainly upskill people in that. So there's leadership and management training, and all these sorts of things, how to influence people, time management, and everything in between, so that when you get to a position that Kevin has, uh, for example, when you're in that director role, you you are armed, pre-armed with the skills required to be able to perform at that suitably um, and that's not something you can just walk into that's something that takes um, a lot of time and yeah, understanding you need, you need to you need to have um, an understanding of not only the underlying technology of the game of the games that you're working with which takes time to build up but you need to also have built up within your lifetime um, the the cultural context of where you are and where you're working with and that's in order that you can come up with these art direction notions about the video games which I was being a bit facetious earlier about, oh, it's easy, it's just you know, <laughs> this, but that's only because I've spent a lot of time with, with the content and, um, and have modest, seen, Kevin, of course. yeah, well, I've seen, you know, I've seen thousands and thousands of uh, images and I've read the histories of all these places and uh, et cetera. It's only because I've got this storehouse in my head of uh, the possibilities that um, it can, I can come up with. Yeah, and also, you know, from your own perspective, well, you might be thinking of projects which we aren't going to make for five, six, seven years and, and mapping those out beforehand of what you'd, you know, so you're refining that way in advance of anything actually going to a production phase. So, um, it, you know, there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes um, for a long period of time that, that people won't be aware of. Um, and the next so question I just, is... I just want to say one other thing, sorry about that, is though one must realise actually that the role of art director is mostly about people management. <laughs> much more so than art direction you know yes. i've got a team of over 100 extremely talented artists um and it's it's my you know my job is to let them help them be their best and it, uh, yeah it's also i think there's a lot of um relinquishing because you, you know you're not just managing people you're managing people who manage people um yeah. which is then even even trickier again um and and being that said um we have a, an interesting question which i think i'll sort of jump on straight away as well kevin if that's okay which is um what should you take for gcse's um uh, and, and whatever comes after um is you really don't know and it's an interesting question and i sort of when i used to give yeah. um generalistic training on employability and all these things yeah. the general thing i'd say is you want to be employable whatever you do so the core yeah. subjects are important um and it's always important to have a backup in all these sorts of things but fundamentally we do not employ qualifications yeah. so your 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 gcse's um unless they're a gcse which is directly employable in an industry isn't going to be of interest to us in terms of that doesn't necessarily mean you have a skill that we're going to employ. So what we want you to do is um, if you've got a good academic background that shows that you, you know, you have certain traits which we can help identify in interview stages, et cetera. But having, you know, a math GCSE doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of being an artist. Um, it might help that you're really good at maths, that you want to be a technical artist um, or a programmer because you have those sort of pre-armed skills. But I would certainly say if you're at GCSE stage and you're looking at what you want to do, the main thing I always encourage people to do is concentrate on what you're good at, concentrate on what you enjoy doing, um, because if you enjoy doing it, you'll do far more of it and you'll perfect that far more. Um, 
but also you've got to make yourself employable. So the core key subjects are always good. And then also after that, the ones that you want to do, the ones that interest you are the subjects you should take. As you progress and you go into college and university or or don't, et cetera, um, whatever your step technique is, you have to narrow that down because if, you know, I myself studied psychology, criminology uh, at university and um, I work in recruitment. Um, so you could argue, is that related or not? Um, and it doesn't really matter. But the what it means is, is that, those that qualification I have means that it doesn't make me suitable for certain other positions. It doesn't mean I can have that and walk into being a mechanical engineer. Um, however, if you study mechanical engineering, guess what? It's pre-armed for you to do that. Um, so if you study game art at university, that's hopefully what it's doing. Um, if you know, if you study um, uh, uh, computer science, then that's moving you towards programming. Although we do have a lead artist who did study. Um, programming didn't they Kevin and then yeah. um, realized yeah. they loved art so much they well switched known to art. <laughs> badge thing everybody knows badge yeah he studied yeah. programming believe yeah. it or not <laughs> so the next question then um uh is, we'll finish uh, up all the questions we've got three more yeah. questions yes. we'll we'll quickly run through those uh, we're already running over time uh, okay. but we'll get your questions done yeah yeah we'll try and get them done as quickly as again for you um so uh, what do you recommend uh, to have in an, an environment artist portfolio um oh. many dioramas large scenes maybe props yes um, I would say, <laughs> <All of them. laughs> uh, yeah, I would say one, you know, if, if the, the perfect, the perfect environment art portfolio would be something like, uh, one or two dioramas, one sort of large scene where you've built it using components, but it can be kind of not so detailed. Um, and then a few, a, a few props, but those props, I would build those, like focus them in on your dioramas and things. Yeah. Uh, the, the main thing is getting things that work together. Um, and, under, and getting understanding of light and seeing how it's going to be built on a level. Individual, uh, I will never hire you to if your portfolio is full of individual props um, because individual props we can outsource. You know, there's a we need people who are working on the game, like working integral to the game, and who are interested in the game and how it's going to come together. And I'd be really excited to see people who are making great dioramas and and making things that come together to make a beautiful level. I would, I would also quickly add in there um, for Crimson Sunday, who's asked that, um, each studio will differ. So um, some studios employ prop artists, some people employ material artists. They specialize even more beyond an environment artist, meaning that if you are someone who loves doing props, there is a studio out there for you, but it might not be us. So I think what you need to do is, is help identify with the job titles that people advertise, but, but also. If but if you're only making props, you are competing with outsourced companies. Yes, yeah, you certainly are. Um, uh, that, that do things in large scale as well. <laughs> so, um, so that's certainly that sort of thing. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Um, 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 the next question is, do, do you have a rough estimate uh, for training application deadlines? Um, and I would say initially the, the quick answer there is, no, we don't. The longer you leave it, the more chance there is it will be filled. Um, mm -hmm because um, we simply go via, we advertise the role, the We're applications not, come yeah. in, and yeah. we, we, we process them as they come in because we have to. Um, so if there is exceptional people in there and uh, we move them through and they go through interview stages, it might take three weeks, a month, two months to finish that. But if you wait, two and a half months to apply, the chances are for any position we advertise, we're at a stage where we've already decided it's between a few people we're going to hire. Um, so unless you you come in and you are of such standard that it blows everyone else away, the chances are you may have missed the boat. So it's certainly key for me. If you see a role advertised and you think you're suitable, get an application in quickly. I don't mean rush it. I mean, spend the time to put it together, but don't just put it off because you've got other things you'd like to do. Um, you get that application in um, because, yeah, it's we don't have time restrictions on them. Um, we will fill them as soon as we find the most suitable person we can do to fill that role. Uh, last question. Um, would you consider future live stream going through some example portfolios? Um, that is quite difficult. Uh, from the point of view, you know, I really do like giving portfolio reviews and you, normally we do them at, at REST uh, and at EGX and I also go to uh, Trojan Horse usually every year uh, to do portfolio reviews. Um, 
the problem the problem is that this feedback is personal um and uh, you know i can't i can't i can't just pick a random portfolio off off of the internet and crit it basically yeah. uh, because that's not fair to the person who 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 uh, you know have chosen and the i also don't want to take volunteers to then sort of project these portfolio reviews to a wider audience because they might have a different um, understanding of the quality of their portfolio than I have. And I don't really want to publicly uh, upset somebody like that, but I would love to give them that feedback in person and in private, but uh, projecting that to, you know, I don't want to be like the Simon Cowell of portfolio reviews. <laughs> But also as well, Kevin, a lot of the interaction we have at events is, you know, you are you are asking them why they've done what they've done, the reasoning behind it, what is the yeah. what you know, what why they've produced these things. Yeah. If you've sent in masses of images with mm. none of that story, with none of that information, yeah. we can't, you know, it, it's very difficult to give you that personal feedback on your portfolio because we've only got half a story. Um and the other part of that story is probably quite That's very right. important to us yeah now, it's so. like every, everybody's on you know their own personal path and and the, your portfolio is not it's not you it's it's just where you are on that path and and my um, um you know, modus operandi with portfolio reviews is to help you take the next step along that path whatever that is so i'm not going to I'm never going to trash anybody's portfolio. If I don't think you're ready for professional work yet, I'll just say, I don't think you're ready for professional work yet, but here's what I think your next step is with your work. I think as well, it's good to mention that um, I did mention earlier about LinkedIn and I think it's, it's um, important for a lot of you who are looking to make these connections that want to connect with. There are lots of fantastic art directors and recruiters and game industry employees who are on LinkedIn, who you can connect with and, ask for a few minutes of their time and they will more than happily give that to you so you can connect with kevin you can connect with myself you can you can have a chat with us um we are busy so we we can't you know we can't necessarily dedicate you know a lot of time to it but we can certainly give you pointers helps tips advice but also you can go to the other studio art directors of in, of other companies you like to work at. It's a huge networking tool. The other thing as well is, is that if Kevin gives you a piece of advice and you take that and you change your portfolio and you send it back to him with those changes, Kevin can see exactly what he likes to see in a studio, meaning that it can then be followed through. So even if you're, you know, you're not going to be, you don't have the skills yet to be employed and it's a year or two years away, if you keep that contact and network, Kevin will be directly able to tell you when you should be applying and when you are ready, um, meaning that, you know, you've already built that connection. So when you come into the studio, you hopefully would be less nervous. You've had the, you know, you know that your your work is something we're interested in. Um, and that is so, a really key networking thing. So if you're desperate to have your portfolio reviewed, um, send me a message on LinkedIn and then we'll do it. Yeah. Cool. So I, I think that's all the questions so far. So um, we'll wrap it up, I guess. So thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, Hopefully you've enjoyed uh, this um, and you uh, are taking a look at the current trainee roles we have live. Um, again, they will be new trainee roles advertised next year and we continue to do that. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, we post them on uh, various different forums. But if you again, if you connect with us on LinkedIn, we tend to post our trainee roles directly on there. So you can have a look at them there as well. Um, keep an eye on our, our social media channels for all our news, updates on games and everything else. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to say thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, thank you very, help, very helpful as always um and uh yeah and thanks to lucy and matt for yes. lucy for organizing and matt for helping us with the um setting it up yeah certainly feel free to thank them and let them know as well how useful you found it to see that you know if you'd like to see more of this sort of content as well um we're always happy to try and try and be as useful um to the community and everything as we can so keep safe uh, and goodbye from everyone at, at ca thank you